All right, welcome everybody. My name is Jani Prince, I'm heading the life sciences team at NIME. And I have the great pleasure today to introduce Isabel Stacy and Scott Morrison from Diasudix. Isabel Stacy is a senior data analyst at Diasudix and she has a background in mathematics. Scott Morrison is a head of data science at Diasudix and he has a background in big data analytics. And both are joining us from Belfast. Welcome Scott and Isabel, good having you. So Scott and Isabel will talk about how they use NIME to enable better testing and better treatment for patients. And I personally think the use case and also the general topic of NIME and clinical data is super interesting. And I'm definitely looking forward to the presentation. I'm sure our audience will also find it fascinating and I hope there will be also engaging questions. So please fire away in our Q&A. We will definitely make sure to answer your questions in the end, we reserved some time for that. And with this, Scott and Isabel, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Jenny. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak at the NIME events. And uh, this one is, is actually a special one because it's actually Star Wars Day. So uh, may the fourth be, the be fourth. with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to introduce um, the company, really, what we're about and, and what we do. A little bit about our data. And then we'll get into the interesting stuff. I'll hand over to Izzy, who will speak a bit about um, our, our use of NIME, essentially, and how we're, we're using to enhance our data, but also revolutionize how we, uh, how we do business today. So if you want to go to the first slide. So who are we? Well, we're Diacetics. Uh, we've been around for quite some time. We started off as a... a um, from a consultancy firm about 14 years ago, maybe a little bit more now. And we've grown really from strength to strength with the, with the power of our data really over the last number of years. Um, so with our data lake, um, we've really emerged and revolutionized <coughs> into a data platform now. And that's just released, uh, it was called DXRX. Uh, but not only that, uh, we also supply uh, consultancy services to pharma as well. We work with some of the, the biggest uh, client, pharma clients or companies in, in the world. We have uh, quite a lot of projects, I think over 600 is the last time we checked there. Uh, we have quite a large reach in, in, our, in our data lake, um, especially in the US, um, where we have um, quite a bit of coverage in total. We have the, a coverage of 365 million patients' lives there. And we've always been a, a virtual company, even before COVID. Um, so this, the way of working now is quite normal to us. Uh, we are based in 53 different countries with offices based in some of those. But as I say, we're, we're mostly a virtual company. Um, we have domain experts in, in many different fields to help get the, your precision medicine to market and, and beyond. And um, we have many different services we can offer within the precision medicine domain. Mainly we extract insights from the data that we harvest. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the next slide. So we harvest data from many different um, sources as such. One of the big focus areas uh, at the moment is our lab laboratory data. We also ingest medical claims data, prescription data, and lab demographics. We house all this data in our, in our data lake in AWS where we find it easy, easier to scale than, than on-site compute. Um, really with the, uh, with the evolution of our DX RX data platform, we've totally um, reshaped how we ingest data. Um, everything is visible in our, in our ETL pipelines. Um, we, we extract the information from raw source, we enrich that data, and we, we make that data available to all of the, the analysts in, within the company to answer any of the, the questions that they're faced um, by our clients. Is able to go into more detail on that, um, but that is a bit of a high level overview in terms of our, our data today. Um, in terms of the information we hold uh, within that data, we can enter quite a lot of specific areas. So the types of stakeholders um, that we'd be interested in there is obviously the patients themselves, but also the physicians, the laboratories and the payers as well. Within that, uh, we can see many different things. Um, from our medical claims data, we can see who's ordered tests, who's performing the tests, uh, the physicians there as well. We can see the longitudinal history of patients, which is quite valuable. And also with the addition of our laboratory data, we can also see not only the tests, 
that physicians are ordering and um, the patients are receiving, but also the results. And that's very crucial for us in a lot of our analysis we do um, in terms of looking at positivity rates. We can see right down to the biomarker level, um, which again, just strengthens our position and, and the types of insights that we can provide our, our, client, our pharma clients today. We stretch back quite a bit, depending on the, on the, on the source. Um, I think our oldest data there, we're sitting at 2011. And uh, a lot of our data feeds are weekly updated as well, um, which, is, uh, which is great to see coming through. If you want to go to the next slide. So although it seems like we're, we're going around with the Hoover and, and ingesting and sucking up all this data, uh, we do abide by the strictest HIPAA and GDPR legislation rules, uh, country-based as well, obviously. So we work in tandem with our, our legal department to make sure that we're staying uh, ahead of the game in terms of what we can digest, ingest, transform, and uh, also provide as an insight to our client today. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Izzy, our senior data analyst. Um, he'll go into, she'll go into detail in terms of how we're using NIME and really transforming that data, that raw data uh, that we ingest from our partners today. And um, so without any further ado, Izzy, may the fourth be with you. Thanks, Scott. So as uh, Jenny and Scott have said, my name is Isabel Stacey. I am Senior Data Analyst here at Diocetics. And um, since I began my job here in 2019, NIME has been an integral part of my everyday work. As Scott has described, we are fortunate enough to have a wide variety and depth of data in our Diocetics data repository in the form of lots of different types of data, but also including lab and claims data. This data is already abundant in details, but we have found that there are ways to utilize both NIME and the medical knowledge that we have as a team to even further enrich our data. We have found that by using NIME and taking advantage of all of the tools it holds, we can cleanse and label our data and then use this enhanced cleanse label data set to create a standard flow for our project specific analysts to use with ease and save time in both terms of process and quality checks. In this talk, I'll give you an overview of firstly how we use NIME to implement logic and business rules we create to label our data and then go on to show how we've created standard flows of project use from this. The first question is why? There are several reasons why patient data will need to be labeled. Most importantly, healthcare data is transactional in nature. So in its raw form by itself, it will not be able to make a data-driven decision. It is currently simply a transaction between a healthcare provider and insurance. The insights actually need to be extracted from that and labeling the data appropriately allows us to discover those insights. Labeling patients also provides a cleaner, easier data set to work with and allows the creations of groupings and filters, not only for our internal project specific business analysts to work with, but also for our external uh, platform DXRX, which our clients can directly interact with themselves and you can see a screenshot of here. What we may want to label varies. Some examples shown are time point, disease, disease stage, the patient's history, the biomarker that's been tested, and the method of the test. So for some of these, we are standardizing data or potentially just grouping data that is already there. Thinking of time point, with a simple SQL statement, we can group a specific date field by year, quarter, and or month. Also the overall disease, so this can be quite straightforward by using ICDs, which are the universal medical classification codes created by the World Health Organization. Using these, we can give each patient a primary overall diagnosis, usually quite easily. So for example, C34 is an ICD used to define lung cancer. So any patients who have a, a C34 in their ICD code columns, they would be labeled as having lung cancer. However, if only with that simple across the board. So many parts of the data will require a totally new label created through a combination of logic and business rules. For example, disease stage. Although, as I just said, overall disease can be fairly easily specified using our ICDs, to get to whether patients, for an example, specifically oncology patients, are at an earlier stage in their cancer, like stage one, or at a higher potentially metastatic stage, requires us to first think scientifically about what this would mean, and then look at the available fields we have, the data we have, 
and see how the scientific definition can be created from what we have accessible to us. So I've included a picture here of um, kind of how we work through that logic. I've obviously had to put a classified on there because we can't give you all the details in this talk um, or we'd lose our business. But you know, what we go is what we go through is we look at the business logic, the medical logic, and then using these, we can create the technical logic from the data that we have. Another kind of uh, example of where we do this is for method of the test. So we don't have this specified in, in a lot of our data. So we have to use a combination of columns to create a set of rules. So was there a panel used? If so, what panel was used? Are there any CPT codes, which are terminology codes available? Is there anything methodology related in any other fields that we can harvest to uh, make a decision on what method the test was done? So how do we create these labels? For the more straightforward groupings, which are consistent across all data and would not change patient to patient, for example, time point, we can hard code these in SQL. For example, for the year field, there are a couple of different ways to do this. One is using a case statement in SQL and just hard coding the year field in. So if the date is in 2018, the year is 2018. Or we can use the date field and extract out the year, given that the year is always in the same position in the date field. So as you can see here, it's always in the first four characters. However, for most other labels, we use control files and create flexible SQL code. We currently have a disease control file and a biomarker control file. And in nine, we implement these using component lengths. These are standardized tables which contain all of our logic for diseases, disease staging, biomarkers, methodologies, and any other business rules that we design. As these are component links, when myself or another data analyst update the tables within the component, every analyst who has pulled the flow down from our NIME server will get a notification alerting them of this update and asking if they want to update that link as well. Along with this, we are able to version control the NIME flow itself by using snapshots on the NIME server. Following the control files is what we call a build SQL component which does what it says on the tin and builds out the SQL for all of the combinations specified in the control files or for whatever options are chosen by the business analyst or on DXRX, which I will show in more detail shortly. For example, if we focus on disease, where our rule is just if the patient has the disease specific ICD, then they have the disease. Within this build SQL component, we have a branch specific to disease and disease staging rules, which you can see here. Using loops and variables, we can create a disease variable where we check if any of the diagnosis codes for the patients are within our list of predefined ICD codes in our disease control file. And if they are, label that patient that they have that disease. And if they aren't, then don't. The loop will go through every single patient and through every single disease available in the control file. Thus, if a patient has two different ICDs for two different diseases, um, say if they have two different cancers, they will be labeled with both of these and not just with you know, the first one. Now to move on to how this labeled data is utilized within a standard flow for our analysts for projects. A general data project for the team at a high level would include pulling the patient level data, analyzing and aggregating it as appropriate for the client. Our initial, initial process of creating a nine flow for a client was done on a project by project basis. These could quite quickly become very detailed or complex and thus be time consuming to both create and QC. Previously, the data analysts like myself would be in charge of pulling the data, but now as our business analysts within the team are in charge of project specific data, these flows were not easy for them to inherit and adapt as necessary. So the aim of us creating a standardized flow for the business analyst was to have one overall agreed upon method to pull the patient level data for each specific cohort and then normalize ways to do common client requests. This would hopefully be much more straightforward to use. It would be consistent where appropriate across projects and hopefully save a lot of time. Here you can see an example of a previous project workflow. So I appreciate that you can't see all the ins and outs of it, but as you can see from the uh, zoomed out version, there is a fair amount going on. Even with parts of it being sectioned off and annotated, for someone to have to take over this flow having not made it themselves 
could potentially be time consuming or difficult, especially if they're not familiar with NIME, to work out what's going on and adapt as necessary for a new project. Here is our updated and standardised NIME flow. As you can see on the slide, I have highlighted the only notes the business analyst should have to interact with to get some of our more cl common client requests. Although more often than not, more bespoke analysis is needed as well for clients, by using this flow, we are sure that the patient level cohort is aligned easily across projects with minimal QC needed rather than having to go in and check this every time. Step one is simply connecting to the database and table where the patient level data is held. This should rarely need changed. Step two is a scan of what column names are available in the table to help create filter options in the menu. So for example, you can see here that the, the data um, already has the date and these B underscore columns, which are biomarker columns, and um, these have already been applied to the data set. And using a group by node shown here, we can see all available dates in the data set to allow us to create a menu filter in a later step for date. Step three is introducing our control files, as explained earlier, into the flow to allow further labeling and filtering. And you can see how the update notification appears um, to the business analyst if the data analyst is to update the component link in the back end. Using these control files, combined with the columns that have been pulled up from the database, we can then create a component consisting of nominal row filter widgets and variables to all together make an interactive menu. So this is what the menu looks like. Um, and the analyst will simply pick a combination of diseases, biomarkers, methodologies, dates, whatever they need. And then the build SQL component I described earlier is used to create these combinations automatically in SQL for them. Now the patient level data is set up, the analyst can use the query and group by node to perform any further analysis or group by any particular field. For example, they could group by year or quarter and count how many patients and tests per disease were seen at that time. Or they could group by lab, uh, what lab a patient has gone to and see how many patients per disease went there and of those, how many were tested for a certain biomarker. They can even go a step further than this and calculate of the tests that were done um, how many of those were positive and further delve into the results of the tests. And finally, the data is read out, ready for the project team and the client. By having labeled patient level data and creating a straightforward to use standard flow, the options really are endless. We have seen that we can label healthcare data with many things, including what, what disease, what stage the disease is at, which biomarkers are tested, how they are tested, and what results come with these tests. This labeling is done by making use of NIME's component links, variables, and loops. Following this, we can create a standardized workflow which ensures that all analysts are seeing off the same hymn sheet. So in other words, anyone using the data will have the same starting point with the same patient cohort and same overall method for high-level analysis. Then for more in-depth analysis, patient level data for, for the specific cohort will be readily available to work on, and again, consistent from project to project. To do this, we utilize NIME's access to SQL database and database specific nodes and nominal row filter widgets. Overall, by making these adjustments and improvements, we have made it easier and quicker to calculate testing, positivity and denial rates, provide methodology breakdowns of tests and further explore the patient's journey. All of these ultimately leading us to better data, better testing and better treatment. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, will we go into the questions now? I think Jenny, you're gonna be. Yeah, thank you so much, Izzy. Super interesting. I have maybe to start with a rather general question, uh, maybe also for Scott. Um, so how have you seen that improving your everyday work, the whole process that Izzy also just described? Sure, yeah. I, I think in any analytics um, company, um, especially when you start to scale, what you notice is if 
if two analysts are given the same problem and same data set to look at, um, they can come up with two different answers depending on their, their view, their cut um, of the data. And um, and that you know problem continues to double as 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 the team grows and uh, the queries come in and are more complex. Um, so if if you give the person the ability to you know basically click on options and um, for metastatic patients, for newly diagnosed patients, um, whatever it may be, so they're all using the same logic to uh, extract the exact same patients for whatever insight they want to drive. Um, so as as he says, everybody's singing off the same hymn sheet. But not only that, it's, it's the, the project throughput as well. I remember years ago in, in diastatics, um, we, we were basically an Excel company way back at the start, um, answering clients' questions with uh, multitudes of Excel files. And uh, it was quite difficult and, and difficult to track. Um, really, with the evolution of, uh, of our data lake and tools like NIME and uh, our ETL processes, it's all came together now um, and overall increased our project throughput as well. Yeah, there must have been also a challenge, right? Also consolidating everything, um, but worth the effort, it sounds like. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Deadlift Bunk. He was asking, what is the advantage for the patient? Can you please provide an example? Yeah, absolutely. So our, our real aim with what we've uh, just shown you today here is to label every patient. Um, what we do with those patients then is, uh, is obviously answer the pharma company's questions. Um, but if you imagine some of those questions could be um, due to a metastatic patient, for example, so we can see who gets tested, who gets treated, but more importantly, who doesn't get tested and who doesn't get treated. And that's really the patients that we're, we're after. And um, we're always striving towards our real model there of better testing and better treatment. Um, so although it looks like we're just labeling uh, a ton of patients here uh, and driving insight from that, that insight is also really playing into the um, who is tested and who is treated as well. That's a good point, yeah. especially the ones that you're missing, right? Uh, excellent point. Um, we have another question from Alice. Uh, that question also got upvoted. Um, so are you deploying this on the server? It looks to me like the analyst um, is interacting with the components on the analytics platform. Yes, um, yes, and and no part of it. So the labeling process is, in, is built into our ETL process via the NIME server. So we have a flow um, built uh, that, as he had talked about to start with, that that labels our patients. So as uh, what gets to a certain stage in the ETL process, the nine flow generates SQL based on our control files. Our control files really cover the variables within that. So how we label each patient for disease and, and biomarker. Um, that generates a huge SQL or huge number of SQL scripts, uh, which then fires up a um, uh, into the database and, and labels our patients. Um, so that's how we make use of, of the NIME server today. Um, we also have our standard flows, which as I had talked to in, in our NIME server as well. Um, now, what the users would usually do there is they would use a mix of the analytics platform and server, depending on the need. Um, but they all connect to the server in terms of being able to get the latest updates from the component links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a good point, right? You're sharing uh, the shared components via the NIME server, obviously. Yeah. And I think that was also someone else was asking, how are you deploying the NIME workflow? I think that that covered that question um, already. Um, and then we have another question by Detlef again, which data must be collected and filed for an effective treatment uh, of psychiatric patients? Um, I guess that's a very specific uh, disease question. Um, Probably one we may want to follow up um, with, with that guy. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get somebody to follow up with you on that. Yeah, there's another one for Izzy maybe. So how can you actually be sure uh, that your labels are correct? Yeah, so I guess there's, there's two parts to this. Like one part would be for the example of the kind of easier label, so to speak, like the overall disease where we, you know, we have an ICD code and we can see that straight away and from that we can map to the fact that a C34 is a lung cancer patient, for example. Um, because the data that we're getting is transactional data, as is anything in, in life when it's connected to money, 
it has to be correct. So to, for the position to be able to get reimbursed at the end, it has to be accurate. So all of our data is already kind of highly accurate, which means that those kind of simpler labels, so to speak, when we're just grouping data, um, we can be pretty sure that they are accurate. When it goes on to um, kind of the, the labels, I guess, that we're making ourselves, like if we're looking at metastatic patients and we need to put that, that um, in, in ourselves, Thankfully, there is a lot of research done. So there's a lot of statistics out there. There's a lot available um, to be able to check. So if we said, you know, we've got X amount of patients and we think that 80% of them develop into metastatic cancer and you look at all the research and like 2% of them, you know, go to metastatic, then we know that we aren't, our rule isn't working how we, how we you know, want it to. Um, the other part would be that in the case of just, you know, metastatic versus early stage cancer, if you're metastatic, you are more like, well, not even more likely, you are only, certain treatments are only approved for metastatic patients. So although we might not be able to see a specific label which says, yes, that patient is metastatic, we might be able to say, well, yes, that patient has had a treatment which they could only have if they are metastatic. So we can kind of see what it implies. Um, and as our, as kind of Scott alluded to at the start, our, our data repository is, is growing and growing all the time. So as we get more data, we can make more informed decisions and build on that all the time. Perfect. Uh, I think Janina's next question also builds a little bit uh, up on that because she's asking um, a little bit around the data lake. Mm -hmm. Did So Janina's asking, did I understand it correctly that you are cleaning and enriching your data before putting it into the data lake? Is that done completely automatic or is there some human interaction for quality control? Yeah, so the, the actual labeling process is, is a totally automated process. Um, it's being created um, via a human interaction. So um, how we label a metastatic patient uh, and how the journey of that patient uh, has been foretaken is, is how we label that patient essentially. So. Um, we, we QC it based on each individual role and each individual disease, um, similar for biomarker. Um, so we know that certain CPT codes will be shared across tests. Um, we will dive into the patient's history uh, at an automated level and make sure that we um, pick up the, the various different um, interactions that would point towards a biomarker rather than just one code that's been built for that could be shared across multiple different tests. Um, so and to kind of round that up, really, it's um, the actual labeling process is, is fully automated and uh, goes through a, Q, a QC process. Every single disease or a single biomarker or method that we label is all being QC'd at a human level one at a time. Um, and then on top of that, then how we interact with that data is also standardized. And I just noticed a question there asking, you know, why do we use the component links if we've got multiple flows? Well. The, the reason is because we share those components between the ETL process and the actual standardization of the data as well. Yeah, yeah. maybe also for those in the audience who are not familiar with the concept of, of shared components, um, what that basically is, right? You can just encapsulate a small workflow snippet um, and then share it via the NIME server with others, but also with yourself, basically, and that allows you, for example, to make a change, and then you can automatically update it in other workflows where you are using that uh, component. And so that really allows you to be more efficient in terms of also the quality um, of your workflow, and that you make sure that all the changes are done across different workflows that actually use that little um, snippet. Um, so that's I think a very great concept uh, overall and it's good to practice, obviously. Also, we always tell people um, to use shared components in terms of, of back best practices, right? Just allows you to be the maintenance of your workflows is more efficient and cleaner. I think a build on that as well as with the coding that we use, um, especially with the CPT, so the terminology codes, um, they are updated yearly usually. So it's quite helpful to have those shared component links because although we don't want to be you know changing them all the time obviously the whole point of them is that they're standardized you know there are going to be updates every so often um, or maybe if a disease code has changed so it's just helpful to know that you know rather than having to make sure you tell every analyst you know you can just set that up and it'll it'll automatically 
alert people that that's yeah. happened. Yeah, and then they can decide if they want to do the update or not, right? You get ask, and then, yeah. and that also makes it a little bit more flexible. Absolutely. And you need to react to changes, right? Things are changing, obviously. <laughs> Excellent. I think now um, another question by Nina also upvoted. Are you also running any analytics on the whole data lake, uh, maybe to find some interesting new insights? Yeah, um, we have to be careful uh, at times in terms of what we what we can join together uh, to drive insight from. Um, but yeah, the, the combination of patient cohorts has been quite successful for us. And so not um, diving in at a patient level, at a cohort level. For example, metastatic lung cancer patients, um, we can see um, who has been tested, for example, in medical claims. But also with our laboratory data, we can see at a biomarker, uh, biomarker level for those tests, what the results are, the positivity rates and things like that. So taking two different sections of our data lake and um, at, a, at an aggregate level, driving the insights and joining those together can be, can be quite powerful. Um, I would say that we could do a lot more with our data than what we do today, and we will, uh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there'll be a lot more to come. Very cool. Yeah, excellent. Always good to have something, a vision in the future as well, right? Yeah. In terms of also, right, I mean, you have, I bet you're also dealing with very diverse data, right? I mean, you, I bet you have, like, in terms of timelines, just like if you look at the patient's history, um, that is probably very different. Is, is that true? And yeah. How are you dealing with that? Well, I'd say one, one part is that, you know, we don't, we can often see kind of large parts of a patient's journey and for some patients we can see their entire journey you know through from being pre-diagnosis being diagnosed having the disease and then potentially going into remission or unfortunately as it is in this I, I guess the data that we're working with sometimes it can be death we can see that entire picture now obviously it doesn't patients might not necessarily go to the same insurance every single time and so we might have kind of parts of that journey which we can't see and I guess that comes back to Scott's point where sometimes you, you have to look a bit like large you have to look at the, the patient cohort and an aggregated form and see what insights we can drive from a group rather than kind of individual patient because there will be those parts which you know we might not have a full journey for every single patient but that doesn't mean that you know it's any less helpful when we when we have those parts missing. Yeah, I think it really strengthens the need to to label uh, or why we want down the route of labeling, yeah. likes of metastatic, newly diagnosed, you know, across all of our, our data sources, we can clearly link there at a, a core level. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, along the lines of the shared component, uh, Tim Eskin is asking um, that you in the new version of your workflow, you're using uh, you are using shared components, and in how many workflows are I using them in multiple workflows? And he was also saying from his own experience that it sometimes happens to him that he creates a shared uh, component and then uses it only once. <laughs> What's your experience there? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the the example we showed there we has been shared via two two main flows: the, the standard analysis flow and, and the ETL flow. Um, it's really the first time we've had a need uh, to share um, something across workflows and on like a, in a production scale. Um, so it's been interesting. Um, you know, we had talked about the idea of putting in the database as well and, and doing it that way. But uh, I think it was, it was just so, um, the, the interface there just made it a lot more easier uh, and made use of the, the name server as well we had at hand. Um, so yeah, I guess yeah, it's up to the user really if, if uh, and, and, how, and the usage of the component there, if, if they're going to reuse those or not. Um, but I guess if there's something in the component that's useful to the team, um, they're going to use it, you know? Yeah, I'd say that as well, because we're, because there's, you know, enough analysts using those flows that those shared components are quite helpful if, if two people are working on two different projects that maybe with the same cohort we need to as, as Scott was saying earlier you know we need to make sure both analysts are looking at the same cohort 
and and I think those shared components really help make make sure that happens. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, maybe as last questions, a look into into the future. Uh, Scott already mentioned, right? There's a lot of things you can do also with your data lakes and you want to do. Can you give us a little bit of a glimpse what you're planning maybe as next steps? Sure, yeah. So um, I, I guess my background is actually my manufacturing. And one thing that was never in short supply was labels for data. Um, and that was usually a test for the product as such. So labels were always plentiful. I've never had to go looking for them. Uh, when I moved into healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry and diastatics, the data that we uh, in the healthcare industry that everybody knows, it's, it's transactions. So it's a transaction between a, a payer and insurance company, um, or else it's a laboratory transaction of, of a test as such. And there's no labels. Um, there's nothing there that tells us this patient is a metastatic patient or when they, that stage uh, started to appear. Um, so now that we have this information at scale now uh, for every patient in, in, our, in our data lake, what we can start thinking about is, okay, how, how do we move to that predictive state now? How do we, you know, if we took a patient journey, for example, or an abundance of patient journeys, you know, what insight could we drive leading up to the, the patient before they could go to stage five or become a metastatic lung cancer patient? And that's, uh, that's something that, that I would uh, like to see and drive forward in the future. Get more into the machine learning, back into machine learning. We use machine learning at the moment to enrich some of our data, um, but I, I think we could be utilizing it a lot more uh, there. And um, yeah, look, um, driving insights through the, the, the um, multiple data sources that we have at a higher scale, not just what the client uh, is asking for, but also what we we believe as a team as we scale as well, uh, will will only um, really improve what we uh, what we output there. Definitely, I'd say just a final thing on that is, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times as an example today, um, lung cancer, and that's probably because that's one which does come up um, a lot more often to us as it as it is a kind of one of the more um, prevalent cancers. Uh, we have done a lot of work as a team to kind of make sure that we can get to that early stage and get to the metastatic stage and that's something which we've had a real drive i'd say really in the last year specifically to to look at all of the other cancers and how can we apply those rules of metastatic of early stage of different staging to, to you know different cancers and then outside of that different diseases i'd say diastatics mean that most of our work would be oncology based or cancer based um and again, recently we've really been diving into, you know, especially with COVID, obviously, different diseases outside of oncology and what we can do to help, you know, the patients there as well. Um, so yeah, I'd say that as well, something for the future to kind of look into like broadening our, our data and broadening our projects and, and where we can help. Yeah, absolutely. And that was for sure already the step in the, that direction, right? That you standardize and then you can apply it to even broader uh, terms. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was really great. I think Thanks. we all learned a lot. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Pleasure to be here. And greetings from Berlin to Belfast. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Chat soon. Bye. Thanks for everything. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.